Good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm David Clemens, the founder and coordinator of the MPC Great Books program. Our guest today is Dr. Mark Bauerlein of Emory University in Atlanta. Mark earned his doctorate in English at UCLA in 1988, and he has taught at Emory since 1989. From 2003 to 2005, he served under Dana Joya as the Director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts. He was deeply involved in two highly influential NEA studies, Reading at Risk and To Read or Not to Read. He publishes regularly in popular periodicals such as the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, the Washington Post, the Times Literary Supplement, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. And everyone interested in saving the humanities should read his article, What Dido Did, Satan Saw, O'Keefe Painted, in the November 2013 edition of The New Criterion. Mark's most recent book is The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future, or Don't Trust Anyone Under 30. He has a couple of copies for sale if you are interested in sure. picking yeah. that up. Uh, Mark previously spoke at MPC as part of the MPC Great Books Program Colloquium, Imaginative Freedom and Political Freedom in 2011. And Mark is speaking today on how to save the humanities and why. To frame why the humanities might need saving, let, and if any of you have majors in the humanities or the liberal arts, you will want to pay particular attention <laughs> to this uh, dire circumstances in, in which the, uh, the liberal arts and the humanities find themselves. Uh, let me comment that MindingTheCampus.com, uh, a website affiliated with the Manhattan Institute, recently held, held a colloquium titled, The Liberal Arts Are in Trouble, Should We Celebrate? In response to this question, Patrick Deneen of Notre Dame said, on most campuses there is barely any semblance of a curriculum shaped around a coherent understanding of the liberal arts. And most of the focal disciplines responsible for trusteeship of the liberal arts long ago gave up their role to serve as conservators of a fragile tradition. Instead, faculty in those fields became hostile in general to the thing that they taught, the Western tradition, and used the tools of their disciplines to undermine the legitimacy of what they taught. Most books were either understood to be repositories of backwards thinking, sexism, classism, colonialism, racism, heteronormativity, ableism, or tools for their defeat. In other words, the works from which it had, one, had been once widely understood were read because every generation was entitled to learn anew from them, Homer, Virgil, Dante, Shakespeare, and so on, could no longer teach us anything that we didn't already know. Such authors and their books were simply props for confirming our progressed views. No wonder people on both sides of the lectern lost an interest in reading and teaching classic works, increasingly substituting them for cultural studies that, confirm, that confirmed prevailing orthodoxies. Please join me in welcoming Mark Bauerlein. Thank you, David. Great. It, it's great to be here, actually. I, I, um, I, I've, I always regard this part of the country as a magical place. I'm, I'm coming from Atlanta, which has no, no mountains, has no water, a lot of big trees. You can never see more than 100 yards in, in any direction. So being out in the west and, and then here on the coast is uh, uh, it's eye-opening. It gives you vision. So uh, d d David mentioned, I, I brought a he, he mentioned you should bring some books. I'll, I'll pass these around if people, uh, if people are interested afterward. But I uh, actually sell them for half price if people want to take a look. Now, the, the thing he suggests I talk about is, is the humanities. Right? By the humanities, we just mean we take works that have some artistic element to them. They could also be works of philosophy, thought, but there has to be some kind of creativity involved that goes into these materials, and we give them a critical eye. Right? We examine them. We analyze them. 
we break them down into their parts. We consider how they're made. We, we apply that critical eye, the critical thinking, to those materials. And that we expect that this is a, a worthwhile activity. It's worth doing. It's an independent form of study that people who are taking courses, paying money to get a college degree, would prosper from doing. And so we assume that this is just a value in itself. Now, in, in today's world here in, in higher education, a lot of times that value to the humanities seems to be getting lost. Right? I mean, how do the humanities help you get a job? Right? I mean, if you go major in speech therapy or audiology, you take a program in there, jobs. You, you have a job one month before you graduate. It's a booming field. They can't get enough people in that in that area. They talk about in, engineering. These are, well, a lot of just high employment fields. What about the humanities? An English major. When you when you go to college, when you uh, go into foreign languages, you know you're becoming French major or a film major. You know that that, that 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 access right into a job isn't so clear. That doesn't mean that the humanities don't develop skills that you're going to need and use. When they ask employers about what are the big deficiencies in workers across the across the board in the world of finance and technology and science, always near the top is reading and writing skills. Okay, we need and business business communication is huge. Right? My brother's a big finance guy. He hires a lot of people and he says anyone who can write is an asset in my world. And what you know, the humanities are going to inculcate good writing better than anything else. But it's it's not a direct kind of endowment that you don't go into, I'm a great writer. And you put down on your resume, great writer. Okay. Well, you can put that. But again, it's not, it's not a degree, it's not a major. So it's harder to make that case uh, for, for the humanities as, as going to get you employed. Also, the, the big push in high schools now is for the STEM fields, as they're called, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We need more people in those fields, everyone says. We need to major in those in, in college, you're not getting a lot of push for foreign languages in high school, for, uh, uh, for, for history, or for English, uh, at least English traditionally understood these days. So it, it seems like for the humanities teachers that you have in higher education, we're, we're just not getting a lot of support. And so the question that we have to come back to is, what makes the humanities worthwhile? Why do people want to take a course in the humanities? What's, what's the big point? Why, why bother? And, and I think that, that for some of you in this room, you, you can answer that question on your own immediately. Uh, others may not have a ready answer to that. And, and the thing that I would say when I, when I talk to a lot of people on campus, I say, how do we push the humanities? How do we get more students in there? How do we get the administration to support them? I say, you have to get down to what is the root of the humanities. Okay. Where, where does it begin for, for students, for professors, for administrators? I think you have to look at this. The humanities begin with an experience. Okay. An individual experience. And it is an experience that involves you you, you, and that object that you're studying. You walk into the museum, and you stand in front of a painting, and it grabs you. Right? Your eye stops. It could be a Jackson Pollock splatter painting. Right? It could be a realist painting of a, of a, of a shipwreck, the raft of the Medusa. But something captures you. You stop, and you go, that, that's really cool. I don't know what it is. I'm not breaking it down yet. I'm not analyzing it. But the first thing is, I'm captivated. Right? My mind is drawn to it. I like looking at that. Or, I, I, I read a poem. And, and I get to some of those lines, and those lines are good. I like those lines. 
They stick in my head. Those are memorable words, and I want to hold on to them. It's one of the reasons why Robert Frost's poems are so popular still. Not because they're in a classroom, but because people read them and liked them and wanted to hold on to them. You all know the poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Those, those are lines, and they're really easy to memorize. Right? Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep. And miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. Those are good, right? Those are good words. That's not me, that's Frost. And you all, you're all going to remember the line. And miles to go before I have promises to keep. And miles to go before I sleep. They stick, right? Someone once called poetry memorable words. Right? The words are really good. You want to hold on to them. That's what I mean by that experience. In the humanities, you open the book. I said this to my students the other day. I said, because some of them hadn't brought their books to class. I said, you guys, open the book. Look. Okay, we're, we're doing we're, we're, uh, the death of Hector in the Iliad. Look at this. These words are a few thousand years old. This moment has been read by generations and generations. Every great warrior knew this scene when Hector is in the dirt, bleeding to death. Achilles stands above him, and Hector, his, Hector is outside the walls of Troy. He's the Trojan hero. Achilles is the great Greek hero. Achilles has mortally wounded him. Hector's mother and father are up on the parapets of Troy. His, his brothers looking down the Greek army is out there in the field going yeah and Achilles says you're a dog and Hector says please honor my body right? give me due rights that a warrior deserves and Achilles says no no I'm going to leave you here on the field for the dogs what Achilles does to his body, actually, after he expires. And what all the other Greeks do is horrifying. Hector just looks up at him in the and says, so this is Achilles, right? the great warrior, the noble Greek. Okay? And he curses him. He said, may the gods remember this. So you, you hear that episode, and again, this is something to hold on to. It's the kind of experience you read it in the book, and it's you, and, and it's intense, right? You're there. You're in that universe. Someone walks up to you when you're in Starbucks and, and says, what's going on? What's going on? This is what's going on. Beat it, okay? I'm in here, all right? Everything else disappears. This is the whole universe for me right now. I'm fully absorbed in this. That's where the humanities begin. You see that poster on the wall? Blow Up. Blow Up. That's a film by an Italian, an important Italian filmmaker named Michelangelo Antonioni. It was an English language film that he did in the mid-60s. The initial event is a guy's a photographer. He's a very successful fashion photographer in London. He just goes out in his car with his camera, and he goes up into a park, and he sees in the distance a woman and an older man cavorting in the park, kind of running around, holding each other, kissing. And he starts taking pictures of them from far away, taking a lot of pictures. Okay. She sees him, and she runs up to him where he is, on this stairway leading up into the park, while the man stays behind. Let me have that. Don't take those pictures. Stop. Give me that film. And he sort of teases her for a minute, and then he says, okay, and he tosses her a roll of film. And then he goes up, and he takes a couple more pictures as she's walking away, 
And he doesn't see the man anymore. The man's gone. And so he, she, she races off. He takes a few more pictures. He goes back. It turns out he gave her a fake, or, or a different roll of film. Not the roll of the pictures he took. And so he develops the pictures in his studio at, at home, in his dark room, in these big pieces, and he puts them up on these on, on a sort of, sort of big workroom, and then he starts looking closely at the pictures and seeing, wait a minute, they're looking at something over here, and then he'll go over here, and he'll blow up that little spot, and he'll say, hey, there's, there's something different in that fence and those bushes. He keeps blowing up the picture. It's a slow, silent sequence in the film. It's about seven minutes, eight minutes long, where he's just looking at these photographs, again, with that intense, <coughs> humanistic eye, trying to figure out what is going on there. And he eventually pulls one photograph, and he gets something around a wooden fence that looks like a hand holding a gun. Things happen from there. But that's the kind of eye, or in poetry, ear, that the humanities should start with. Right? It's a compelling scene. That you, that you get in, in that sequence. And it is all about looking closely, figuring something out, looking at lines of sight, looking at vision, looking at composition, the colors. He's got to try to discern, has a murder been committed that I photographed and I didn't quite realize it? The question is elaborated upon as, as, as the film as the film goes on. But that's what would be, I think, the fundamental humanities experience. You look in your own lives, and you say to yourselves, what are the songs that I want to hear over and over again? Okay. Those moments when I'm in the car and I want it loud, right? That's where the commitment starts. Okay. Those lines of verse that you came across in, in high school and college English that stuck in your head. The scenes from the movies that you thought were powerful or compelling or they engaged your intention and really became part of your sort of part, part of your part of your mental equipment. Right? Part, part of your your, your framework, your background. Right? <clears throat> These are the things that, make, that, that the humanities cultivate. Your ability to appreciate those things. And to recognize that developing that ability, I'm talking moments to the, to the students here, developing that idea is developing your character, developing your humanity, making you into a more interesting person. You go into a museum, and you walk around, and eh, eh, nothing touches you, you're closed up. You've got to open your eye. Right? You've got to see things that maybe other parts of your world close you off to. You make yourself uh, more amenable to these artistic experiences significant occasions in literature and art and philosophy and film and so on. Music. Right? That's something to cultivate. <coughs> so we talk about the humanities really as a form of, of cultivation, of development. It is forming thinking patterns. Uh, you would say to yourself that uh, examining the Antonioni film is going to exercise my mind 
my eye. It's going to make me think more than a Spider-Man film. And, and I need to develop myself by becoming more exposed to those materials. And I think it's, 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 it's a captivating film. Okay. It's a little dated. It's, it's kind of 1960s stuff. But uh, it, 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 has, it has some sequences that will mesmerize you, uh, I think. So... I was, I, I'm not sure how long, I think I've talked about 20, 25 minutes. We've got 50, and I wanted to leave, uh, yeah, oh, long, okay, <laughs> I'm a little over. Let's talk. Let's converse. I, mean, I, I intend only to go half, halfway through, and then open it up for comment or discussion. Maybe we should, we, we, could, we could do something my students hate to do. When I, when I said, so we won't do that. But what, what they hate to do is when I say, let's go around the room and you tell me the last, the most moving, powerful, impressionable uh, literary experience you've had, Re- reading books that you've had. And you can't just say the book, you have to say the scene in the book that really hit you. So, but we won't do that. I'll start about yes. Mark. So, you've talked about how the how the humanities create these cultural works, like you know, art, film, books, and they're important because they move us, they they challenge us, they interest us. So that could be a defense for the creative humanities. What about for those of us? Why should our students learn from us how to read poetry or? how to analyze film. Is there a connection between the creative arts of, uh, that we could demonstrate and, let's say, the analytical humanities? That, that's a great question, because that's the next thing, right? After you have this deep, moving experience, the joy or the solemnity that comes with listening to certain kinds of, of music, well, what is the next step is right criticism. Analysis, reflection, okay? and and you say where, where does that come in? And I, and I think on this score, it comes in. You say, have you had a guide, a teacher, or a write, another writer of some kind who has written or talked about that film and made it even richer? Who has shown you... Now look, look at this. When you, when you look at this painting, okay, look at the composition here. Where, where does your eye go? Do you see how everything moves your eye back to this spot? Okay. You, you, you would say, does that make my enjoyment? Is my enjoyment fuller, richer? Uh, do, I, do, I, do I get more out of it? You know, if, if you... I, this happened to me a while back. I was listening to the opening of an opera by Wagner called Tristan and Isolde. Okay? And it's very somber, slow pacing. And it, it, it keeps saying... It, it, keep, it keeps repeating one chord. Okay? Now, something... I heard that, and something, something got to me about that. I said, that's... Something's going on there. I don't know what it is. I'm not, I'm not uh, a musician. I don't know that much about music uh, in terms of technique. So I, I clicked on YouTube and other places. There is something called the Tristan Chord. It is called the Tristan Chord. It's that chord. And it has been called, this is where modern music begins. And you've got some scenes where someone breaks down the chord into its pieces and say, see, part of the chord goes down, do, do, part of it goes up, do, do. And that tension actually helps create the effect. But they're not harm- it's not a harmonized tone. It's atonal, and atonality is a very important element in, in modern music. Knowing that made me listen to the chord and enjoy it more. Okay? I, I, 
the knowledge that came with it, the capacity to see its, its pieces, its elements, I'm, I'm there even more so. Okay, so it, it, it takes your pleasure, your, your, just your, your, your unadorned, I like that. I want to look at that some more. I want to hear that again. And it adds to it that critical component. It adds knowledge to what you're hearing. And in the best cases, that knowledge enhances your, your understanding. So you read the literature, you read an Emily Dickinson poem, and sometimes it's kind of confusing. She'll write, further in summer than the birds, pathetic from the grass, a minor nation celebrates its unobtrusive mass. Emily, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay. Further in summer than the birds, well, she lived in western Massachusetts. Further in summer than the birds means after the birds have flown south. <laughs> she names it later in the poem, late in August. Pathetic from the grass, a minor nation celebrates its unobtrusive mass. You've got some references to church music later in the poem, like canticle. It's some, ele- some animals, not birds, a minor nation. Grasshoppers. They're in the grass, going, cheep, cheep, chirping. Instead of the birds up in the trees, twittering all their song, there are millions of grasshoppers now. A minor nation, and the pun on minor, in a minor key, right? A minor nation celebrates its unobtrusive mass. Now, there's music to those words. She, did, she could have just said, the birds are gone and now grasshoppers are chirping. That's not memorable. But listen, fur, there, summer, birds. She's putting the music into those words. It helps make it stick. So, or, uh, I mean, this happens many times with Dickinson poems, and when you explain it, again, the, the key is for the explanation to facilitate your experience. Okay? To see more. So that if, you're in your, if you're in architecture, you learn the language of architecture. So that you look at the front of a building, you see the facade, and you're, if you get the language, if you learned the knowledge, you would know, oh, those columns are Doric. Those are Ionic. Right? Those are Corinthian. You can identify things. That's dentilation you know, along, along, along that ridge. Okay? You know styles. If you know Gothic, you know Romanesque, you, you know the, the ancient classical architecture, when you're walking in the mall in Washington, D.C., and you look at the Lincoln Memorial, you've got a reservoir of knowledge that lets you appreciate that building and enjoy it more. It's a beautiful Greek temple. And, and knowing that and seeing what it's for and how it works, it, it, it's, again... So that, I think, is where we can see the humanities as a valuable building upon enrichment of that fundamental pleasure that, that you take in, in, in certain things. That, well, now we can go further with sort of more critical social interventions, forms of critique, and looking, but I think mean, that's a further, further, further down the road. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and you've written some very interesting things, especially recently, and I'm wondering who some of the um, um, literary and philosophic mentors were yours that first grabbed you where you live, that you were, were so important to what you're talking about. Well, What's for, missing in education today, maybe? For, for me, certain things grabbed me when I was 17, 18 years old. I read, when I was 18, I read The Brothers Karamazov. And I was completely taken with Ivan Karamazov. He's this 24-year-old, so he's close enough to be my own age at the time. He, he, he's brilliant, he's talented, he's, but, he, but he's, he's a tragic figure because he's become an atheist. Right? He's lost God. 
and it is one of the things that actually destroys him. Uh, he becomes he becomes mad uh, over over this loss. But that grabbed me very powerfully, and. Uh, other things around that time, you know, reading Nietzsche was was a big experience uh, for me. You read the first paragraph of an essay Nietzsche wrote called On Truth and Falsity in its Ultramoral Sense. You read this and you go, this is another order of thought. <laughs> this, is, this is powerful stuff. And it's, it's, it's got, it's, 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 uh, it's put the zap on, on my brain here. Um, uh, so, I mean, names... Now, uh, things then... My critical uh, mentors... I mean, I still appreciate essayists like T.S. Eliot, his criticism of things. But I was very much in, in the age of, of, of uh, literary theory and cultural theory and these figures, you know, Michel Foucault and... Uh, Jacques Derrida and these, these important French thinkers at the time who, who, who captured me a lot. Um, but these days, I, I, I'm really uh, uh, taken with reading um, a lot of those uh, a lot of those great works. They're the ones that. That, that stick for me, and I, I mean, I love Emily Dickinson's poetry. I love Robert Frost's poetry. I love Flannery O'Connor's short stories. Uh, you wrote are amazing. About William James and also Walt Whitman a lot. What about those two? That 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 Whit- Whitman Whitman is a giant, right? He's 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 monumental. Um, I'm, I'm in a different place, <laughs> and, and you know, as I'm, it, it, when I said if you encounter something that's great. And you go, eh, that's a bad response. If you study it, work through it, know it, and appreciate it, but then you say, it's just not my... It's just, I was talking with, with, with David about this earlier. And at, my, my, my wife loves classical music. She, she loves listening to Mozart. He's a genius. You know, he, he's, 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 he's Mozart. You know, I'm nobody. But it's just not my thing. I like these late, you know, late romantic, uh, so you dark, kind of gave dark them up people. After you wrote about them, you dealt with them, and then kind of went on. And well, I mean, I still teach yeah. them, right? I, I, they're, they're still part of part part of the, the American Literature Survey that, that I do. And William James is is a great is a great thinker and still fun to read. But <coughs> uh, you know, just um, uh, the passions go go elsewhere these these days. The Emily Dickinson poem, what, one of the things I was struck by there was the way you were demonstrating use of metaphor and symbolic thinking. And I just want to put that on the table. Could that be part of what we offer that you don't find anywhere else? And the creative artists, that may be embedded in what they do, but they can't, they, they, they can't necessarily take you here and show you how the metaphor, how the symbolism works. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. And is that what what value does that hold to society? You know, what what is the larger value of teaching people how to read metaphor, and how to read symbolism, and how to analyze it? The, 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 good, good. One thing is metaphors, images, uh, uh, figures of speech in general. They can be very powerful. Even when you come down to a nickname, right? A nickname can destroy somebody, right? A human being that gets a nickname that is unwanted, that right there shows you the power of figurative words. Right? Uh, an image can do the work sometimes better than an entire, uh, an entire policy paper. You know, way back in the, in the 70s, there was a big anti-litter campaign in America. People used to just throw trash out the window. You know, driving along the road, trash, dump it. Okay. There was one 
very powerful commercial that some people may remember. It is, go ahead. It was Chief Dan Gilford, Indian. And, and he's on the side of the road, an Indian. And a car, lo- a car goes by. Uh, was, is it a family or a bunch of... And what do they do? Throw their trash out the window. It just shows him. Okay. That was better than... Don't litter. Now, littering's bad. Please don't... No, that doesn't work. That, that one stuck. Or what was the most famous anti-smoking... Message: uh, a, uh, a physician coming out and giving you rates on emphysema, lung cancer, and smoking. What's the whole? Well, it, well, I'm thinking of something actually rather disturbing. Do you remember the image of the fetus? There's a fetus in the womb. The, a pregnant mother is smoking. It shows the, and then it shows a fetus in the womb, puffing a pew. Yeah. Okay. That, and and it, 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 that actually disturbed many people. But right, right there is a creative image. No words. And there were no words in the... Uh, I don't think there were any words in the, in the littering one either. You didn't need them. Now, here is where I think the analysts would be of value to say, how did this work? What was it? about that image. Obviously, there are a lot of levels of meaning that are going to reach people on. We need people to come along and explain that for us. We need to have knowledge about what we are thinking and doing, sometimes when we're not fully conscious of what we're thinking and doing. I mean, the power of image is, remember, can go in either direction. The Nazis were masterful manipulators of images. Okay? When, when, you sh- when you look at newsreels from the 1930s, before World War II broke out, you'll see newsreels in London showing British leaders. Okay, they're, a little, they're a little grainy, and the camera's kind of set up. It looks very ad hoc. right? Just, just we're putting it together. Then you look at an image of a Nazi rally, maybe with Hitler speaking. First of all, you have Hitler framed by these massive Nazi banners, swastikas. You've got him shot from below, looking up at him. Big, big clouds with sunlight, you know, bursting through, framing him. It is quite sophisticated in myth-making, right? We have myth-making going on here. So, this is one thing about the power of of images and the necessity, or of any artistic creation, because of of their power. We need to be able to understand uh, these things. Not that we're ever going to understand them completely, right? There is something mysterious and magical and miraculous about some of these lines of verse that we can't ever fully explain. We don't really have to. But we need to make this inquiry into what, you know, what can happen. I mean, you, you take a film like Birth of a Nation, and then this is where sometimes we get, a, we get a complicated issue. Birth of a Nation is a 1915 film by a cinematic genius, D.W. Griffith. Birth of a Nation is the celebration of the birth of a nation. You know what the nation is that it celebrates? The Ku Klux Klan. The Invisible Nation, as it was called. The Klan was created a couple years after the Civil War ended, the first Klan. There There were three distinct clans, actually, in U.S. history. But... Griffith's film is a work of genius. It is a work of artistic talent of a whole other order. And it is morally repugnant. Everyone went to see this film 
filmmakers copied Griffith's techniques for decades after this. He's one of the pioneers. And yet, it's disgusting. You know, it's a race, it's a white supremacist film based upon a very popular white supremacist play. Uh, there was actually a, a, a play made out of a couple of novels by, by uh, a man named Thomas Dixon. But this is actually uh, an important issue. And there were protests outside theaters where this was shown. And there was a lot of controversy surrounding the film. Griffith actually tried to make some amends for that message in a follow-up film called Intolerance that he made, which was not moral, was, was, which, which is morally admirable uh, film. But anyway, so this is something to, you know, to, to consider. Uh, when art becomes very powerful, but in the service of either immorality or outright falsehood, Art that becomes propaganda. Good art can be very good propaganda. The Nazis, again, were masters of it. And they regarded it as, a, as, as, a, as necessary. To Stalin was a, was a, was a huge uh, propagandist as, as well. Stalin, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, for uh, 25 years, uh, 1928 to 1952 or 53, around there. He actually did. Do you know what Stalin used to like to do at night? Kill people. Well, uh, apart from that, <laughs> Stalin's motto, he had, a lot, he, he had a lot of enemies or imagined enemies. His motto was, no man, no problem. <laughs> that was the, he liked to say that. But... He liked watching American films, and his favorite American films were westerns with John Wayne. He loved John Wayne. Anyway, other uh, I, I, a few more minutes. Now I want to now look. The students here, you have to say something that hit you. So someone volunteers something that hit you. We we don't have to discuss it. Yeah. Well, this other question is about like saving the humanities. Uh, what do you suggest, like, for teachers, like in high school and stuff, to get them more interested in, and to think more critical about artwork and you know writings? And Coach, how, what would you suggest that they do? Well, they're I mean they're doing noble work as it as it is. The the thing, uh, you know. Um, I mean, all, all I can say is, you know, in, in my own work, my goal is simply to give students that exposure to things that I think are, are worthwhile, that, that, that will stick, and to give them that guidance, that critical knowledge. And I say, look, Dante, he begins in this dark wood, right? He doesn't know where he is. He's confused. He's off, he's, he's, he's left the, 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 the right way, and he wants to get out of the woods, he sees a light at the top of the mountain and says, yeah, there it is, I'll go up there. And then these beasts keep popping up in front of him. He, where he turns, they pop up. Okay, you see the point? Dante, you've gotten into this dark wood because of a profound moral and spiritual error. And there's no easy way out. You can't get there just by climbing the hill. Oh, there, that's the answer. No, life is hard. <laughs> okay, things are... I mean, this is what I... Just try to impart, and and so I would say to the, the the teachers, just say pass along the pass along the the that infectious desire or enjoyment, you know, because nothing is going to help the humanity survive more than love, all right, devotion. We can admire, but we also have to say, I want this. That, that's what will, 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 will make students want to take them, those courses in college. They may want to major in those things. They'll want to go to museums. They'll want to donate a little of money to, to those public libraries. Uh, that, that's you know, exposure, um, uh, exposure to, to great things. And you, know, you, you, you say... 
What do the students want? What, 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 what touches them? You know, Dido was, was, was one thing that mentioned. You make, you make it relevant without dumbing it down, right? Dido is the queen of Carthage. Aeneas shows up on her shores. They're building this great city, and she, he comes and talks about the fall of Troy. She falls in love with him, madly in love with him, literally madly in love with him. Well, the gods come down and say, Aeneas, you can't stay here. You've got to go found Rome across the sea. You've got to go. He says, okay. He leaves. She finds out he's gone. And actually she senses she's got radar. She senses he's pulling away and she gets mad at him. You did it. You can't. I can't believe you're going to do this. You're going to leave. What is it? And he says, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. I've got to go. The gods are telling me. You know, this, this, is, this is a very easy to translate this argument into contemporary terms. It's not me. It's not my fault. Uh, and she's getting mad. I can tell you're leaving. You want to go, don't you? So he sneaks off. So what does she do? She has her sister make a big pile of goods that belong to him. And Aeneas left behind. She places on the top the couch where Aeneas and Dido would sleep together. Okay? She takes, she climbs to the top. She takes her sword. She has them ignite the bottom. She takes his sword and she kills herself okay? with his sword, not just any sword. In other words, you did this to me. You destroyed me, Aeneas. These pages are one of the most powerful ruminations on rejection. Okay? You fall in love. Life is wonderful. Everything is great. And then you get dumped. Okay? This happens all the time to college students. This is a field of reflection okay, on that experience. You can see Dido's... You know, she, she is unnerved. She, she's suffering from a disease. Her love is a disease. She becomes irrational. Aeneas gets called back to his rationality. The right thing to do is, is, is to go. She can't do it. So you give these materials to students, and, and you see, you, you, you hope, you hope or, or people, you know, your friends, you hope that they stick. So you, you, so you, you, you hang out you hang out with friends who are into this kind of stuff. You seek these people out. You seek the people out who want to go sometimes to the museum instead of the sports bar. Okay? You, you, you seek them out. They, they read the newspaper uh, instead of uh, uh, watching MTV. Right? Sometimes. Oh, you know, it's just not, you know, never do it. No, no. But a little more of the good stuff. So. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't know. Do you guys have classes? To go to? We got time. Okay, okay. I just wondered if this is a corporate world in any way. Uh, Causing what you see is kind of a lack of interest in the humanities. Uh, partly, yes, uh, because the corporate world wants people with skills to do the job. Now, they will also say, however, that we like people who have imagination, who have some creativity, who are good writers. And you talk to corporate, you look at corporate figures, they, they respect Shakespeare. If you, if you go to an interview, a job interview, with uh, some, some finance firm, and you go out to lunch with three people, and they're in their 50s, you, 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 you students here, and what are you going to do if one of them saw a movie, a Shakespeare movie? You going to have anything to say? Anything to offer? Or if they, if, if, if they talk somehow, you know, Russia, we've got a lot going on with Putin, right? And people are talking about the Cold War again. What do you guys know about the Cold War? What do you know about Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev? Can you offer something? Can you bring something to the table? Okay? This, this, and, and I think that counts. Background. With, yeah, just, 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 he, this, 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 uh, this youngster, this 23-year-old, knows some things. 
it, it, it impresses people if you can participate in, in that way. Yes? So, would one, um, oh, how do I say this? Uh, would you attribute, say, the death of humanities or, or, or the lack of interest thereof um, with my generation to possibly lack of funding? Um, because, you know, because I, I remember in high school, you know, a lot of, of our music programs were cut just because we simply couldn't afford them. You know, I was going to bring that example up, the loss of music programs. You know, in New York City, all schools in fifth grade had a big, mu fifth grade was a big music year in all the schools. Okay? You learned, everyone had the chance to pick up an instrument in the public schools. This is, you know, learning, well, let's, okay, we're going to do some orchestra here. We're going to learn basic stuff, and we're, we're you know, we're going to listen to Mozart or Peter and the Wolf and learn that. And I think the, maybe it's not loss of funding so much as shift in funding yeah. over to reading and math. Sure. Because on the reading tests, the math tests, you have high stakes for schools. If your students don't score well, you got a problem. So we're going to take some of that art and music funding and we're going to put it into after school reading tutoring to get them up to speed for those tests. I, went, I was talking to a journalist at the Washington Post, an education journalist, and I said, so he's a prominent, prominent guy, does, does a, lot of, a lot of columns in, in magazines and newspapers, and he, I, I said, where do the arts stand in your reporting? He said, they don't. And I said, what do you mean? He said, the arts aren't tested. I can't hang a number on the arts. Art scores went down three points. That's a story. If I can't hang a number on it, it's not a story. Okay. So if I, I think I think uh, shift in funding, yeah, away from a lot of those, and I, and I think that's a loss because you know one thing, the arts are not touchy feely. Oh, just express yourself, right? What what happens if you're in an orchestra? You can't express yourself <laughs> until you get you know anyone who any and anyone who makes a mistake, we all know, right? I mean that's why sports, same thing, right? It is discipline, it is competition, as well. Same thing in uh, in the arts, and I think that's one of the reasons why we like the arts, because the arts are a place where we can see talent and genius, and it inspires us. In sports, we see talent, okay? We see ability, we see accomplishment, and it inspires us. Right? These are, uh, I, I think they happen in, in, in art as well. Uh, you, you, watch, uh, <clears throat> you watch some, you watch some films, you look at it, you look at sculptures, but I'm looking here at, at materials around the room. Dave, David has in his office a sculpture grouping called uh, the Laocoon, the scene from the Iliad. No, no, it's seen from the Trojan War. Uh, and it's, it's amazing. This sculpture grouping is actually uh, three people being attacked by sea snakes going way, way, way back. Um, you just go, wow, wow. And, and so this is not the only... You listen to the first three minutes of Tristan, Wagner's Tristan, real loud. And you say, only a genius could have written this. Only, only someone with, with a special ability. You know, Wagner wasn't a very good guy. You know? But you, you, you would say, you know, he, this, he, he created this. And that's, uh, that's, that's extraordinary. You, know? you read Frederick Douglass's narrative, uh, Life as a Slave. Some of those sentences, and the evocations are so powerful. And, and, and you say, this, this, this guy was born a slave, didn't know his mother, maybe his father was, was his master, doesn't know when he was born, beaten, whipped. He grows up, and, and he, he's one of the greatest rhetoricians of, of American literature. This guy's amazing. And that's the thing. You want to say, 
there is that you do the critical, but after you first you say this is just amazing here, right? This 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 this, this, this guy can put words together in an incredible, an incredible way. Same thing with the Gettysburg Address. Right? It's worth memorizing, as every American school child used to have to do. Everyone had to memorize the Gettysburg Address, and it's easy. Because Lincoln is so great, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it cannot forget what they did here. Okay. And he based that speech Lincoln. on a speech by Pericles. Pericles, okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if um, part of the problem is, like, you, you've, you've spoken about how this movie, Blow Up, is a great movie. Like Spider, you implied Spider Man wasn't, and you've used the language of genius a number of times. So embedded in your thought is the ability to distinguish between great and good and bad, or something of that sort. You yeah. have a you have a, a you have a criteria of judgment. But have we, in the wake of of, of uh, post structuralism and and uh, multiculturalism, both of which, incidentally, I think have valid arguments behind them. But have we also sort of lost our ability to say this is this is this should be in the canon? This is great. All of you young folks here should read uh, Dante. All of you should read the Iliad and the Odyssey yeah. and so on. Yeah, and and I think a lot of arguments that said, look, these artistic distinctions, they're they're really kind of phony. They may really be more about. Uh, a cultural group reinforcing itself in some way, and I think those are those are fair arguments. And and you want to avoid the fussy, snobby, kind of that elitist attitude. Okay, that's not we don't like that in the United States. Okay, that, that that's anti-American. It's anti-democratic. But here's what we want to say. We want to say. I mean, I think that we have to be able to say there are great works, rare works of talent and genius. And that's what, we, that's what you're going to get here. We're not going to put down Spider-Man. We don't want to do entertainment's entertainment. We all like slumming it now and then. That, that's, that's fine. But you want to say that here in our classes, we are going to give students works of the ages, Things over the centuries that people have loved, you know, that George Washington loved, right? that W.E.B. Du Bois loved. That's what we're going to get here. That's why our classes are worth coming to, and that's why, we're, we, that's why we charge tuition. That's why we can say we're an important part of the curriculum. We have to be able to stand up and say, you're going to see greatness transpire. In, in this class. Now, here's the thing we want to say. Greatness for everyone. Right? Okay. Shakespeare for everyone. And you know what? Shakespeare was the most popular playwright in the 19th century in the American West. There were Shakespeare troops that would go to mining camps and give performances, and all these illiterate miners, actually most of them weren't illiterate, but these miners, they loved it. They got caught up in it. In one performance, a guy pulled out his gun in the audience and he shot Iago. <laughs> you got that? That bad guy <laughs> shot him. Didn't kill him. Okay? But we think we shouldn't think of this. Oh, oh, Shakespeare. Oh. We've gotta we've gotta, you know, go into some you know temple and you know, revere. No, no. It should be out in the streets. It should be. It should be. You know, quoted. It, 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 you know, over lunch. Uh, so, you know that we want the best materials. But again, we, we we meet the goal of saying everyone should have this. Uh, everyone should have it available. Everyone should understand the difference between uh, between Shakespeare. I mean. Italian opera had a craze in the United States in the 1840s, 1850s. Okay? They, they couldn't... The opera singers in New York from Europe 
they would finish the opera, and then the audience would rush on stage, they'd pick the singers up, and they'd carry them outside, put them in carriages, and toast them all over, they'd ride them all over town, and cheer, and drink, and, and uh, applaud. Right? <coughs> the mob, the rabble, the hoi polloi. Right? There wasn't that, that, that class separation about these, these cultural matters. So uh, uh, this, is, this is where, where um, Where, where we can insist upon those, those great works without denigrating popular entertainments and meet our democratic mission. Okay. Did, 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 uh, did you want to talk about Jane Austen? <laughs> Dickens? Charles Dickens? Uh, uh, I'm just kidding. Sense and sensibility. You like that? Yes. Sense and sensibility. Jane Austen, right? One of the one of the one of the great English novelists. Good, good. Does anyone want to volunteer any uh, any 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 particular uh, love? Tim O'Brien. Tim O'Brien. Why not? Contemporary. Yeah. He might, he might last. He might last. I mean, you know, one, one of the things you want to say is, you know, you can love things, but you can you know, also say to yourself, okay, is this going to last? Will people be reading this 50 years from now? That's right. my bad. Yeah, could be. That's what my advisor said. Yeah. I cannot base your thesis on hero worship. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, when you're, when, when you're in criticism, you got to let, yeah, the hero worship, you have to... <laughs> But, I think but, it, but, it, but, it can, but it can inspire you. He's hit Sparks notes, so maybe that says something. Popularity. There you go. Still I mean, it, it's assigned a lot. So. If we have time for one more question, there was one over Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I was just um, wondering if you um, like saw any movies or heard any music that came out within the last like, five or ten years that you think is uh, you know, equivalent to, you know, I am, I'm a, I'm a hermit when it comes to recent, recent things. And I, I'm, not, I'm not bragging about that. I don't think that's good. I wish I were more attuned to contemporary things. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Probably the last, the, the oldest film that I thought was interesting was a film that was a huge hit with teenagers about 15 years ago, called The Blair Witch Project. <laughs> Anyone ever seen this? But oh, you've all seen it. You know what? I, 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 first of all, I, I was living alone at the time, and it, it, it creeped me out. <laughs> it, got, it gets to you. Actually, I grew up not far from where they were supposed to be, uh, in Maryland, uh, outside. So I write, you know, those, those, that countryside looked familiar. But there's a point at which it starts, you can't stand these three these three characters. They're, they're obnoxious. Uh, Generation X types. And, but but uh, you, you start, there's a point at which it says, something bad is going to happen. And I'm feeling it. Okay. You want something bad to happen at the beginning to them because they're so obnoxious. But there's, there's a change, maybe some identification that happens because you're with them. They're, one of them's holding the camera but you know when things really start to go bad with them? You remember what they they do something wrong. Anyone from the movie? You remember they go into that little plot of ground that has up in the trees those black X's? It's some it's some sacred space. It might be a burial ground. It could be some something Someone has created something there, and they go in and they vandalize it a little bit. They desecrate it. Right. What does the word desecrate mean? To take its sacredness away. Right. So you guys have done something 
Now, you're, you're not just being silly kids. You're, you've done something seriously wrong. And it's part of their initial motive. There's this Blair Witch Project. There's Blair Witch Legend. We're going we're gonna to go investigate it. They don't respect a local legend. They're irreverent. Okay? They're irreverent 25-year-olds. They don't revere anything. They make fun of things. And this is part of what they pay for. Right? How about that, that element of Blair, Blair Witch Project? And the cinematic technique of... It's kind of a silly... It's an easy one. One of them's going to be holding up a video camera. So it's all on bad video camera. Okay, so uh, that was... In, but it, it's, it's actually common in youth horror films, right? Teenage high school films. Uh, you know, you, 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 you've got you've got a high school guy and girl, and they're at something. They're going to run off. They're going to go do something. They're, they're going to go have sex. Or they're going to do something illicit. Those are the ones who always get killed first, <laughs> right? <laughs> They've stepped out of the bounds. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. If they stayed where they were supposed to be, they wouldn't have gotten nailed. Okay, so so <laughs> you look for things like. I mean, I mean, th- 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 there are things, you know, the, the critical eye. Uh, how many of you ever seen the film, uh, The Kid, Back to the Future? You know, the screenwriters of that film are rewriting Sigmund Freud's family romance. It is exactly taken out of Freud's Oedipal Triangle. Okay? Mm-hmm. The boy goes back in time. He ends up, his mother likes him. His father is a wimp. And it's a fantasy in that what he does is he's able to shift his mother's affection over to his father, and he makes his father into a man. Okay? This is, this is the, Fro, Freud laid, laid all this. I mean, the script writers obviously <laughs> were saying, let's have fun with this Freudian model here. Let, let's make some interesting humor out of it. Because remember, what's happening the night... He goes back in time. He's supposed to meet with his girlfriend. They're going to go up and spend the weekend together. Right? It's a big, big, big moment for them. A big sexual moment for them. Anyway. Uh, okay. I, yes. one last thing. Um, how do you feel about Robin Williams' uh, Dead Poets Society classic? You know, I, I have a thing about Robin Williams. Well, I, I, just, I do too. I, he he gets poets, so sickeningly he's sentimental. So he starts talking so often. He's so sensitive, and I want to kill him. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but uh, hey, look, at least they're talking about poets. Right? They're, 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 well, well, yeah, actually, you know, you're right. At least that's the ostensible topic. But I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like that movie about the, that, that much because it, it, uh, um, I, I think it sentimentalized poetry too much, and and um, it. Uh, I mean, he said in the yeah, beginning. He yeah. says in the beginning. You like Whitman? Tear the. Was his favorite poet. Yeah. Well, no, but but he he, yeah. he says tear the criticism out of the book. Oh yeah. Well. Tear those pages out. We want just the poetry, no critical discussion of it. That, that, that's what I mean by the... Oh, by, it's by diagramming it. That's what he's trying Yeah, okay. Yeah. I get you. But anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> but you made a point. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is not to answer her question, but um, I think that Darren Aronofsky is kind of a modern master of cinema. He works a lot in like, myth and archetype, and the way he weaves stories together is really beautiful. You got that, everyone? How do you spell the last name? Um, A-R-O-N-O-F-S-K-Y. There might be two R's. But Darren Aronofsky, he has Noah as a huge blockbuster. It's like one of his first blockbusters. Oh, Noah, oh, that he did Noah. I haven't seen it yet, but yeah, okay. it's incredible. His work is really amazing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. We should probably wrap up. Okay, okay. All right, good talking with you.